the gasp of, you know, it was kind of awe, you know, that came across the radio as soon as the snipers came around that point and they could, they could see the fireball, you know, it's five kilometers. So it's over three miles away. You know, it's just lighting up the night sky. President Obama paid tribute today to the 30 U.S. troops killed over the weekend in Afghanistan. Navy SEALs, soldiers, and airmen killed in the helicopter down by insurgents in eastern Afghanistan. We knew right away the Taliban was responsible for the helicopter crash. 30 servicemen died. Welcome to Heroes Behind Headlines. I'm your host, Ralph Pizzullo. Our guest today is Sergeant First Class Nicholas Moore of the 75th Ranger Regiment. He's going to talk about his attempt to rescue Extortion 17, which was the call sign of the Chinook helicopter that was shot down by the Taliban on August 6, 2011, and resulted in the death of 17 Navy SEALs, including 15 from SEAL Team 6 five U.S. Navy Special Warfare support personnel, three U.S. Army reservists, seven Afghan commandos, two members of the Colorado National Guard, two U.S. Air Force pararescue men, one U.S. Air Force combat controller, one Afghan interpreter, and one U.S. military working dog in the largest single loss of life in the Afghan war and the greatest single loss of life ever suffered by the U.S. operations community in their 24-year history. All of this and more is chronicled in Nick's excellent book, Run to the Sound of Guns. We're honored to welcome back Sergeant First Class Nicholas Moore of the 75th Ranger Regiment as today's hero behind the headlines. Well, I, this would be my third deployment, so three is like kind of the magic number before they... Um, either move you to staff or, you know, at the discretion of the commanders and uh, in the company and, and at battalion, um, whether they want you to stay and do one more. And what it really is, is not that it's a favoritism thing is that you can't take all the platoon sergeants and all the platoon leaders and you can't trade them all out all at once. Right. 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 So you want to, so you kind of have to have some kind of continuity in there for the, a senior seasoned platoon sergeant to kind of grab the new platoon sergeants and say, Hey, look, this is, you know, this is how we do business and this is how it's done. And these are the things that we have to think about. And it's just kind of to help even, even the field. No, it makes and, sense. It's and practical. So, yeah. Um, so you're the seasoned guy at this point. No, oh, you're no, not. I, I'm still the, the new guy. Oh, okay. Um, the two platoon sergeants that, oh, that's right. You uh, just... The other two platoon sergeants have been there one more deployment longer than me. And so, um, they were getting ready to um, get, you know, re- replaced at the end of the deployment. And so uh, it was either me or one of them that was going to get asked to do another another rotation as a platoon sergeant. And the uh, first sergeant, Sergeant Major, asked me, you know, what I what I want to. And I said, well, why wouldn't I? Why, why would I want to go pound keys on the computer and staff when I could <laughs> do this for, you know, nine more months? And uh and they said, okay, great. You know? And so I knew I was going to get to be a platoon sergeant for one more rotation, um, a- after this one that was coming up. So, um, along, along with that being said, we were being surged. Um, that deployment is kind of the end of the, the whole special ops, um, surging, um, you know, and, and all that stuff started that was going in, on I think, at, 2010. At the times. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so what it was, is that either, um, one one platoon went or one company went early and then one stayed later to kind of leave um, three extra rifle platoons in Afghanistan to kind of fill the void and we just kind of plugged them in wherever hotspots were and 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 did things like that and so it was our turn to to go and so we were the last of the the companies from second battalion to go on the surge and so with that comes the every year special ops community JSOC or uh, USASOC. Um, does a kind of a, we call it a dog and pony show, but what it is is so um, Roger Goodell has come down to Fort Bragg right. and, you know, football players right. and, and congressmen and senators. And, you know, it's a big deal for USASOC to put this, you know, basically it's a presentation of all the stuff that we bring to the table. And it's mo- mostly it's, it's uh, meant for the president um, to show him, you know, the, the capabilities of, you know, what, 
the special operations community brings to the table. And so we got tasked with um, doing a little mount clearance thing. And it was fun because we got, you know, a little bit of working time to work out some some things that we were trying out for us. And so we got a week with the helicopters to, to go fly in and and do this stuff. And it's just one platoon that got to do it. So it was um, first platoon that, that got to do it. So my platoon and then the other two platoons, they just got, you know, unlimited amount of ammunition to do all the extra training and things that we don't normally fit into training at home. So we got to, you know, those guys spent a lot of time on the range doing uh, pistol marksmanship and things that we just don't fit into a uh, normal training cycle, a home station. And so while we're flying around doing, you know, this presentation of, you know, ranger tactics and, you know, those, those kind of things that, you know, the whole thing lasts 30 minutes and, <laughs> and then we're done for the day and, then we get to go do what we want to do and, and shoot bullets and, and train. And so, but it was kind of fun cause we got to, uh, you know, have the helicopters and, and, you know, a little bit of playtime and, and try things out and, you know, stuff that we don't normally get to do at home. So then we finish up that week and, um, come home and then get the, the taskings of where we're going to go. And, um, so, uh, when the taskings came down and they said, Hey, you're going to go up, um, you know, um, one platoon is usually always going to be away from the company headquarters element. And so it's, they picked us to go, um, fob shank and, and, you know, be attached to the seal command unit that was running the task force there in the East. Uh, the other two platoons were with a company commander doing what we were calling, um, team Merrill. And it's kind of a, um, a, f- a flex element, you know, we can go in and, and do, um, remain over day operations and, and kind of instigate fights and, and, you know, trying to stir the battle space and, and get reporting and, and things that we don't normally do on a nightly basis for tactical, tactical actionable targets. We're trying to generate that intelligence to create more targets um, by that, that element doing what they're doing. So we're up, up in the kind of ups outside of, you know, Kabul and doing the, Target sets that have to do with uh, weapons facilitators and IED okay, facilitators. That's the big, we're not working. That's the big we're not working. Then. You know yeah. the the very tip of the pyramid of, of the targets because that's a very select deck, and we're not working at the bottom of the deck because the, the emplacers and the guys who are just randomly shooting bullets at the at the conventional army units. You know that's that's their target deck is the bottom of the deck. So we think of it like a food pyramid, and we're kind of taking out the, you know the, or the meat and the vegetables there in the middle. And, and so what that does is that creates more actionable intelligence when you chop the middle out, um, because then, then it gives a lull to the guys that don't have any weapons or IEDs to in place. And then it creates a problem for the guys at the top of the pyramid who are trying to figure out how to fill the voids of the guys that just got taken. And those guys in the middle, they're the, they're the ones who are able to give you, uh, actionable intelligence, you know, up and down that pyramid. So that's kind of, so you're the, going the after those we were, guys, you're grabbing them. Right. Yeah. And you do know, you do and, interrogations and, or not, you turn those over. Um, no, we, we do uh, a basic interrogation on, on, on target, um, to, to just figure out we call it atmospheric. So we want to know who's, who belongs here, who doesn't belong here. You know, if they don't belong here, how long do they, Where you know, they when did they from? show up? Yeah, yeah. You know, is it a family member? You know, it, did we hit the right building? You know, we're looking for this, you know, we'll, we'll let you stay if you, you know, tell us where to go and, you know, we'll leave you alone. We'll give you a little money for the stuff we broke. And, um, so that, that's kind of how that was working. And, you know, we were running, um, what we called combined operations with the SEAL team that we were tasked with. And, um, it was, it's kind of always slow in the early, late spring and summer because the people, you know, the weather's nice. So people are moving around yeah. all the time. And so it makes it hard to, to target. So what we were doing at, at, you know, at the time when we were doing combined ops with the SEALs is we were going in and, and clearing through a bunch of old, information that we had and old data and old targets and we're just kind of you know is this something isn't it something so we we're launching on a lot of those kind of targets right. almost like cold case eye. stuff yeah right or you know is it something to keep an eye on or is it just something that was relevant at the time six months ago and so we we're going through and clearing a bunch of that stuff out and you know just trying to empty the deck you're doing that you do these targets. raids mostly at night it's all at night, all at night. yeah okay um, and so we're going through and hitting all these little areas and stuff. And so, um, you know, it's working out pretty good and we're having a, we have a decent working relationship and I, I say decent and it was actually a pretty good re- relationship. Um, is it Rangers and seals don't always, yeah, I've heard. 
mix mix well you know um uh and it's it's a culture thing it's it's not a not personal it's not a tactics yeah. not tactics thing it's not a personal thing um you know it just you know they're they're who they're who they are and we're who we are and we all do things just a little bit yeah, different, different and roles. sometimes you just get right and so you know it might be a budding of heads between um leadership it's not the boys you know it's not the the operators themselves and, and it's not the, the rangers themselves it, it's just that you know like um uh, myself and my platoon leader might not totally agree with the way things are handling with the uh, team leader for the seals and and their master chief um so sometimes you get a good collaboration of of rangers you know seal leadership and everybody sees eye to eye and and the best way to to use you know all the assets at hand and we had, we had a good relationship in that in that aspect and you know we got along with the majority of, of everybody pretty well uh, you know and so we were doing these these joint ops and then something kind of went sideways on one of them and you know it was it's was just one of those those things and you know at this point you know the geopolitical situation that's going on in Afghanistan is really putting the the handcuffs on on how we can do things and I made a comment to my platoon leader and I said hey look I, I like these guys but I, I'm not getting under this kind of an investigation for something that's going sideways on on these targets and we just need this needs to stop. In Nick's experience, Army Rangers face constant challenges working with Navy SEALs, in part because the Navy SEALs were notorious for bending the rules of engagement to fit whatever they wanted. And they tended to take all the most important targets for themselves and leave the lesser ones to the Rangers. This tension between the SEALs and Rangers continued into the summer of 2011, when Ranger Bravo Company, where Nick served as platoon sergeant, deployed with members of SEAL Team 6 into Logar and Wardik provinces south of Kabul. Their mission was to keep Taliban IED emplacers and combat units away from Highway 1, which was the most important strategic approach to Kabul. In early August 2011, U.S. intelligence assets reported that a senior Taliban leader named Kwari Tahir, codenamed Lefty Grove, was operating in the strategic Tangi Valley in Wardik province. Initially, the SEALs didn't want to go after Tahir because they didn't consider him important enough. So on the night of August 5th, Sergeant First Class Nicholas Moore, deployed by CH-47D Chinook helicopter into the valley with 47 other Army Rangers and landed near the compound where Tahir was suspected to be. And he goes, no, I completely concur with you. And this you. is and just so how they're ha said, handling people that you pick up. Right. And and so, you know, we just kind of went and talked to, to Jonas and Lou, the the Master Chief and the and the SEAL commander uh, at the time. and said, hey, look, we got nothing against you, but we're not getting caught in that. And, and you know, you guys, you know, if you need us on something that, that requires it, we'll be there. But this, you know, we're, we're not going to do this. You know, you guys do your thing and we'll do our thing. And, you know, we'll... If, if we got to put it back together, then we'll put it back together for something big. And, and, you know, but otherwise, you know, let's, let's take the opportunity that we have of, with two strike forces and let's just, you know, hit more targets is, and he goes, okay, fine. Great. Awesome. You know, no, no animosity and uh, came into a, uh, a situation that, you know, based on that, that there um, we had embedded Af Afghans um, that had been vetted through um, U U.S. forces that, you know, we had. So the Afghan partner unit, and so we had seven attached to us as a ranger platoon and they had seven attached to them as, as you know, the, the seal team. And so that becomes what we call minimum force. So you have to have those guys to be able to go out on target. And so based on what happened on that, that previous target, you know, the, the guys that were working for the seals got upset and the <clears throat> they didn't work for them for the anymore. SEALs. Right. Yeah. The Afghans got upset and, and so they didn't want to work for them anymore. So we had to kind of go try and figure out how to smooth the feathers that were ruffled and, and so had to talk with the, the two Afghan squad leaders and, and, you know, I asked mine, um, do you have a problem going to work for them? He goes, no. And I asked the other guy, do you have a problem coming to work for me? And he goes, no. And I said, okay, great. Well, we're going to switch. And so what we did was we, we switched them and then everything was gravy. Uh, it was good. Every, you know, they were happy, both of them. And how, how and important so, were the Afghan, uh, 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 elements that you had with you? 
Uh, it was uh, the men, what we call men force. So we couldn't prosecute a target without them being with us. So for them to be, you know, upset and in that kind of situation is a huge deal. And so, you know, we have to try and figure out a way to smooth, smooth this out. If you're not so, getting cooperation from them, nothing's going to happen. Right. Or if they don't want to go out and, and be a part of the strike force or, or they refuse to go on target because they have that right, they can say, no, then we can't go. Oh, and wow. So they have to that try much authority. Things, well, it's, we gave them that much authority based on the geopolitical situation with everything going on in, you know, with with Kandahar and Karzai and, you know, U.S. forces and politics, you know, that are going on in the background that nobody's seeing. It's just that You're we just getting understand yeah. what's going on as the shooters on the ground because we have a very strict, tight uh, rule of engagement for being able to prosecute targets. And so with with that being said, you know, I – I went and talked to to Lou, and I said, "Hey, Lou, we, we I fixed the issue with the with the APU, and you know, so we're just going to flip them. You know, you'll take mine, I'll take yours, and it's it's all good. They're they're happy." And he goes, "Okay, great." And so he knew it was happening, and I knew it was happening, and he and I both forgot to tell the jock for the big manifesting, you know, and confirming who's assigned to who it was just, he thought I did it. I thought he did it and it just kind of got forgot. And so, um, you know, this was on a, on a few weather days and we had had like three weather days in a row. And, um, then the weather cleared and while we were asleep, um, cause we're operating at night. So we're on third shift. And so, um, sleep during the day, get up in the afternoon, um, dinner is breakfast and, um, so the target comes down for objective lefty grove and uh we got up and did the the daily update brief on on what targets are actionable or what targets are up and moving and um and lefty grove said, is well, one of these mid-level lefty guys. grove is the, is the biggest of the of the targets that are are up and and you know with the the confidence to the you know to prosecute the target as far as the percentage of you know what we think he's doing um it was, you know, somewhere about 70%. It's kind of on the lower side of what we like to go at, but we've just been sitting for three days doing nothing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, nobody likes to just sit. And so um, we finished the, the briefing and, and Jake and I went, uh, my platoon leader, and went and had breakfast. And uh, we're kind of kicking it around. And I'm like, what do you what do you think? And he goes, well, you know, it's, you know, it's not, not great probability. And I was like, well, it's better than 50%. And he goes, well, that's true. And I said, we kind of have this little window of time here where we can actually get out and go do something. You know, we've sat for three days. The boys are chomping at the pit to go do something. We're going to have weather here in a couple more days. We might not get another target for another week that we can actually launch on. And he goes, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I'm willing to take a swing for 70%. And he said, okay, great. And I, I said, I, I, I actually, I, I honestly think that, you know, this is this will pan out, and if it doesn't do anything, it'll disrupt what he's doing and let him know that we're on to him. And you know, when we apply enough pressure to these guys, then they start making mistakes. And you know, it might not get him on the first shot, might not get him on the second shot, might not get him on the third shot, but eventually you'll put enough pressure where he'll make a stupid mistake and it'll play out in our favor. And and it had worked for us, you know, several rotations in a row to, you know, the guys kind of get tired of chasing the same target after a while. You just want to catch the guy and move on. But so I said, well, let's just take a swing at it. I mean, you know, and and so we went back and said, hey, look, we're willing to take a swing on this. And, you know, it's the Tangy Valley. And, you know, the 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 illumination for the night, you know, it's playing in our favor. We are on the new moon cycle. So there's no illumination. It's just stars in the sky. There's no moon. Um, you know, it's, it's blacker than black outside. Um, and I said, well, you know, it, it works out in our favor to take a swing at him in here. You know, I said, and if nothing else, you know, it's the tangy Valley, you know, it's, it's everybody hates Americans in the tangy Valley. They hate <laughs> Americans just as much as they hate the Taliban. They hate everybody. Or the yeah. they, if you're not from the Valley, they hate you. Right. And they want to fight you. Right. That's just the way the culture is in that Valley. And so uh, we knew we were going to stir it up in there. And when, so we were, you know, we got approval to go ahead and, and uh, write the, the operations order for the, for the objective. And so we 
you know, wrote it. It got approved by higher command and then, you know, briefed the boys. And, you know, it was kind of fun to sit in the, the briefing and, and tell the boys, hey, look, you know, it's not a question of of if we're going to get in a gunfight tonight and to, you know, stay relevant. It's, it, you, this is going to be a gunfight. We will get in a gunfight before the night's over. It's, it's they don't like us historical. There. It's a historical fact. You know, every mission that's gone in has been a gunfight, you know, that we can pull back up for, you know, almost a decade at this point. You know, every time we go into the Tangy Valley, it's a gunfight. Yeah. <laughs> and so everybody was all excited because everybody wants to get in a gunfight. And it's fight. a particular and tribe so, in there in the Tangy Valley? Uh, it's uh, or not a really. Warlord uh, or warlord? It's not, a, not even that. It's just, you know, it's like a cultural thing. Like you don't come in here unless um, we like invite you. You don't come in here unless we invite you in or unless you're born here. You just don't come in here. And so um, there had been a, a combat outpost in the Tangy Valley um, that uh, had, you know, it took mortar fire and indirect fire and artillery fire and rockets. And it took it on a daily basis <laughs> so much so that they just closed it down. And we'd put a combat outpost on the west side of the valley at the mouth of the valley. And we put one on the east side and there was nothing in the middle. And so for us to go in there where Americans, we just don't go. Like if the battle space owner wants to, you know, go from one cop to the other, they drive around the valley. They don't drive through it. It's the roads heavily IED through there and it's a guaranteed gunfight in there. So, you know, we're excited, you know, cause Hey, look, we might not get the guy we're going on target for, but we're going to get in a gunfight. And so, um, brief the boys get kitted out manifest call and uh you know go over to the helicopters load and go and um uh, have to make a quick stop over at cop saida bad and uh part of the the planning that we did was um it, you know in in this particular region it was it was a an sop that we worked out with the the battle space owners is that we would go pick up one of their representatives so a senior squad leader, platoon sergeant, the first sergeant or company commander or, or somebody's platoon leader. That way, if we messed up stuff in their area, then we didn't have to write a bunch of reports because that leader from that unit who's responsible for that, well, he was there firsthand and he could explain it and, and you know, hey, this was necessary or this is the circumstances that led to it. And he had all of the details. And so what it did is just made a better handover when we would hand off our target to them after we were done. And so it, you know, and it worked out great. So we swung over there, picked up that kid then flew back around the the Valley and, um, uh, infilled our forces on the ground. No issues. Uh, typical infill, you know, in and out for the helicopters. And then they flew back, refueled, uh, and sat on the helipad. And, you know, we got off the HLZs, walked, up onto the, to the road in the Tangy Valley, the Tangy Road, and uh, started moving moving to target. According to Nick, the tribesmen who occupied the Tangy Valley, roughly six miles south of Kabul, didn't like the Afghan government, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, or the Americans. They liked only themselves, their clan, and were willing to defend their valley with everything they had. In the past, whenever the Rangers had sent strike forces in there, they always faced serious gunfights. And the night of August 5th, 2011 was no exception. Infill was not a problem. But shortly after Nick and his fellow Rangers landed, they detected a lot of movement in the valley. The 47 men armed with two heavy machine guns and two rifle units quickly covered two kilometers, supported by Apache helicopters, attacked Tahir's compound and captured some of his men. But in the process, Tahir and a group of his fighters escaped. The fight was on. Right. We started moving and, and you know, and as soon as we did it, it, you know, the helicopters came in, they landed all the noise from, from them. You know, the, the whole valley came to life. Uh, we had guys running off our objective, guys running up the side of the mountain, guys running down the, the valley. And, you know, it's just like cockroaches when you turn the light on <laughs> they just went everywhere. And so it was like, okay, great. Awesome. Everybody knows we're here. And so, uh, continue to move and, you know, intelligence is reporting back to us that, Hey, you have, you know, between eight and 10 enemy fighters moving on you. And so, okay, hold the force, um, clear to engage, uh, with Apache gunships and killed eight. And then, um, uh, two, 
two squirted. And so we kept eyes on them, went ahead and pushed the target, uh, started the assault on the objective area. Um, everything went according to the plan. You know, there was nothing, nothing crazy going on on there. And so then I took one of the squads and, and we went down and cleared through the, the eight enemy combatants and then did what we call a squirter chase and started chasing the two guys that left the original engagement, um, for about a, a thousand meters. And, that, you know, that's kind of where I, I pull a chain on it. Cause that's where I, I lose the ability to support myself with my own organic element, you know, with so my machine too guns far, that I bring far the target. And, yeah. Yeah. And so I, you know, we, we did a whole, I called my platoon leader and said, Hey, look, we, we don't got them. They can't talk us onto it. They're in the orchards now. That's stupid. I'm not going to continue to chase this because we could be, you know, when this is over, we could be, you know, over a mile apart. And, you know, I have like 11 guys with me and you have everybody else with you. And that's, and so we agreed that, you know, we'll just stop there and we'll keep eyes on. And if they come back, then we'll, we'll deal with them. And so then I brought my force back to the, to the main objective area and, and continue to clear through. And so all this is going on, you know, um, the big jock back at, at the base is, is watching the, the big picture of everything that's going on. And so they see all this movement that's going on in, in the smaller, um, villages, you know, between, uh, three and five kilometers down the valley. And, you know, they start asking, you know, these guys are rebel rousing, you know, we've got a force that's gone from eight to 12 to 15. And, you know, are, are we going to go do anything with this? And I said, well, why, you know, I, I talked to my platoon leader and I was like, it doesn't really make any sense why we would, you know, dump this target right now. And I said, what, what do you, what are your thoughts on the objective that we have now? And he goes, well, I want to clear a couple more buildings in here, but I think we have what we came for. And I was like, okay, great. Cause I'm kind of the same judgment. And, and so then I, I walked over to him and we kind of having a face to face conversation instead of on the radio. And I said, you know, I, I want to, you know, get in a gunfight, but I don't want to walk down the valley and, have it 50 50 that's that doesn't work in our advantage right. and it's yeah stupid. we're in their territory um, yeah yeah and so if you know we can hold this target all night long and we can defend where we're at because we own the high ground if they want to come down the valley and they want to play with us you know then then good on them we have plenty of time you know for them to you know for us to watch them yeah. come down here and us to get set up and you know and it's almost no risk to us in, in this that situation he goes no i completely concur and i said okay we'll tell the jock that we're not going to dump this target because we we think we might have what we want and so you know this is all going on in the course of, of this conversation so then the jock comes back and um they said hey you know the seals want to come in and do movement to contact um on, on this element that's kind of up up in the west and i said well there's plenty of space between us so you know if that's what they want to do good on them um it's just we're not going to dump this target. But to, that was that had that. nothing to do with the target. That was just separate. Right. That was that was a separate. That was you know a secondary effect of us being in there, okay. and we knew it was going to happen. Right. So they we would just kind of stirred up the the hornet's right. nest, and the hornets right. were moving around. Yeah. Correct. And so it was you know we had enough separation of space between what was going on in the west from where we were that we could insert the the seals on a separate objective for them to come in and do movement to contact and and get in that gunfight and so that we weren't shooting at each other or catching ricochets or anything like that. There's plenty of space. Um, so they said, Hey, do you guys care? And I told Jake, I was like, if that's what they wanted to good on them. <laughs> yeah. I was like, as, and you know, and, and prior to this, you know, Lou and I had had a conversation. He said, you know, when you go in there that this is going to happen. I said, yeah. And I said, so he said, well, well, when we come in, um, I said, I said, well, we'll just work exfil. You know, we'll just have to cycle the birds through. I, so I don't care if you go first on Xville or if we go first on Xville. It doesn't matter to me. And he goes, okay, great. So, yeah, I, you know, that was worked out between the two of us. And, and you know, Jake, my platoon leader, knew it. And and his uh, commander knew it. And the jock knew that that was kind of the the ongoing plan that, hey, look, we'll cycle through. And the SEALs will, you know, they'll go out first, it, you know, when it's time. And, and then the Ranger Force will come out because we're just bigger. We can hold, hold a bigger footprint right, longer. Right, right cover and, them um, yeah yeah right and so um you know jake said oh he said you guys got that worked out right and i said yeah yeah i mean we'll just link up on the ground and you know we'll just lock down the hlz's and cycle the aircraft through until everybody's out and so you know we had that quick conversation and then they, about 10 minutes later said hey they're they're loading up and they're getting ready to go and so then that comes into 
us trying to throw a recommendation in there real quick was, uh, Hey, you know, um, probably smart if the aircraft, you know, infill flying over our objective, cause we can cover the ground. And, and so that was, we passed that to the, to the jock and, but ultimately we're not responsible or, you know, make those decisions. That is the, the aviation unit's planners that that make that assessment and decision we can make recommendations right. all day but long. it makes and, sense like if you're flying in we can cover we can cover the ground while you guys right fly so in. that was yeah. you know that was the recommendation that that we made now the, the planners and it's not a knock on them because yeah. they're doing their own assessment right of, of weather and that all that stuff and, yeah yeah and, and so then they decided so we had infilled from the east side of the valley from east to west and so the seal team was going to come in from west to east and so um so you weren't going to see each other yeah no no we weren't we would we'd be able to hear it and we would see the the aircraft as they were doing the the infill the the flush out after they had inserted the team we would be able to see the the aircraft on the way out but just not on the way in and so we were trying to to hurry up and clear this last building real quick before um we needed to hold what we had um and so that there wasn't a chance for, you know, stray bullets flying through the air, um, you know, while that helicopter's flying through. And so we, we pushed in real quick and, you know, nothing was coming across the radio. And it was this long delay of time and just started asking, you know, in my mind, I'm like, what is going on? You know, what, what's the deal here? And, you know, so I turned and, you know, I asked the the <clears throat> FO who's on the fires network and, and the helicopter uh, radio transmission and said, well, they're, they're not in yet. They're not in yet. And then all of a sudden, uh, I'm like, what? And so then all of a sudden, you know, we get the, the call that, you know, there's a fallen angel. As gunfire reverberated throughout the valley, the commanders back at Bagram decided to insert another team to go after Tahir while the Rangers held the compound. The quick reaction force included members of SEAL Team 6, Afghan commandos, and other U.S. Special Operations personnel. The second landing zone was in the narrowest part of the valley, and the commanders didn't want to split up the strike forces, so the whole team went in one Chinook helicopter, call sign Extortion 17. Two Apache attack helicopters provided cover, and an AC-130 gunship circled overhead. Nick had advised his platoon leader that the safest way to enter the valley was east to west. That way, they would overfly the compound and he and his men could provide support with ground fire if necessary. But on the night of August 6th, a moonless night, the SEAL element followed a flight path west to east. As the Chinook descended to tree-level height, Two enemy fighters waited with rocket-propelled grenade launchers on the roof of a nearby building. The first grenade they fired missed. The second shot hit the rear tail rotor assembly of the Chinook. Around 2.40 a.m., an Apache pilot flying in support came on the radio and shouted, Fallen Angel! Fallen Angel! Nick heard the call and was dumbstruck. You mean we have an aircraft down, he asked? The answer was yes. It was just hit me stupid. I said, say it again. You know, it was a kind of a question. He goes, we, there's a fallen angel. And I said, okay, now say it in English. I said, that helicopter, we have a helicopter that's been shot down. And I said, uh, okay. Um, is it just like broke hard landing broke or, you know, or is it, you know, like shot down, shot down. And they said, no, it's shot down. And so it was immediate from that, you know, started pulling guys off rooftops. And so did and, you know immediately that it was that helicopter seals or not? Um, well, we knew they were the only two aircraft that were coming in that weren't already in the battle space. So we had Apaches on station for, for close air support for us. And, you know, when you had other assets in the, you know, in, in the, the area that were assigned to us that, that were ours to use. So it could have been one of them. Yeah, but the chances are very unlikely that it would have been one of those other aircraft. We would have known um, if it had been, you know, one of the one of the Apaches in support. We would have we would have known that early because they were already there, and and so you know started pulling people off rooftops and, and started telling them you know where to go and 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 they said, well, what are we doing? And I said, just start walking. 
I said, go, we got to go. We got to go now. Started pulling guys off, collapsing our, you know, our objective, all our guys, getting them back in, getting a quick accountability of, of equipment and, and started moving. And, you know, we're moving, we're moving to the objective, to that new objective, to that crash within about three minutes. Yeah. Did you know where, did you know where it was or you're just approximating? We were approximating that we didn't know the exact location for the, for the HLZ, but there were only a few approved places in the Valley okay. that were at, um, coming in and, and they were coming in on the HLZ that we had pre-planned to use. Oh, okay. So X-Fill. you knew. You, so yeah. they said the name of the HLZ. And so it matched up with where, you know, the approximate location of where we were going to end up going. Okay. And so, so, you know, uh, kind started of where to go. Pushing yeah pushing west and we knew that they were coming in to deal with stuff in the west side of the valley anyway and so there was this um spur coming down where the road had to wind around this point on on the side of the the valley wall and it kept us it was obscuring our ability to see down the valley that far um so i told just told the guys i said hey when you round that you'll see exactly where we're gonna go and in my heart i knew exactly what we were looking for and I couldn't, you can't explain it to somebody that, Hey, you're just looking for a fireball. And, um, so my snipers took off and run a point, had the, had our canine out front, you know, sniffing the road for IEDs and, and things like that. And they said, well, what are you going to do if we run into one of these? I said, just mark it. And, you know, so that everybody knows what it is and they can stay away from it. And we just have to assume, you know, risk to force that, you know, it's not going to go off and we just have to, we got to get there. And so we started pulling everybody off and started moving down the road. And, you know, we had this large cache of, of equipment and weapons that we had taken off the eight that we had killed plus what was in the target buildings. And so I sent one of the squads forward, you know, to be able to find a spot to set that um, stuff down so we could, uh, destroy it. And, and so it was just kind of as, you know, I, I, as a platoon sergeant, I always kind of push the train. So I'm the last guy in the formation and I'm, I'm making sure that everybody is, you know, together. And so I said, as soon as you see me walk past, you know, pull it and then we'll blow it in place and, and then we'll just keep going. And so they, they set it up, we blew that stuff. And I just remember the, the gasp of, you know, it was kind of sh- uh, awe you know, that came across the radio as soon as the snipers came around that point, oh, and they, God. Could, they could see the fireball, you know, it's, um, five kilometers. So it's over three miles away. You know, it's just lighting up the night sky. It's just this huge, it, I can't even describe it. it. Was it a Chinook that it's, went down? It was the Chinook. Yeah. So a big helicopter. Uh, Distortion yeah. one seven yeah. was its uh call sign on the radio. And so you always know, start moving and, and, um, my platoon leader and I start having, you know, conversations on the radio, but he's kind of jacked into the the sat radio because everybody's wanting all of this information from all of, you know, the big jock and Bagram, the, the jock and shank, you know, all these command units are, are starting to, you know, want all of this information that we can't really give them, but they're just chewing up the radio and, and Jake's trying to, you know, get brain cancer from the amount of, you know, radio waves that are going through yeah. the head. And you know these so, guys, but, right? Right. Yeah. And so, uh, um, especially the Afghans, the, you know, real well, uh, not, not very well. Not, not me personally. No. Cause I, I'm not the, I was assigned a squad leader to be the point of contact with those, those guys. And it's always usually my weapon squad leader who is responsible for them is kind of like the go between like the, so they have a face to, to say, Hey, Mike is, you know, Mike's going to be the guy. So if you have an issue, then you come find Mike and then Mike will come find me. And so they have just one guy that they have to, to learn to, to deal right. with. But you've or, been working you know, with all their, these guys. So, you know, that. Yeah. right. For, you know, over, well, we got there in June. So for almost 10 weeks, I guess we've been working with the same guys. Right. And so with familiarity, so it, gives, of, it makes it personal. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, but you know, we didn't know that they had brought their Afghan partners because um, the way it works is we had Afghans with us on our objective, so they didn't have to bring theirs. Oh, okay. Uh, because there's actually Afghans already on the ground. Oh, I see. I see. Um, yeah. But because we were far enough apart, there was kind of this questionable, you know, well, can we get away with that? Can we not get away right. with that? So to err on the side of not getting the mission, you know, rejected, they went ahead and brought theirs. They and took so, them. Yeah. Um, Right. And so we're, we're in this walk, yeah. you know, it's basically a, a very slow run yeah. is, you know, we're moving as fast as we can to get down there and, and stay, stay together and, and, you know, still be able to fight, you know, if, if the need be on that end. 
I um, started asking, you know, my platoon leader questions. I was like, Hey, how, how many people are on that aircraft? And he, he goes, uh, I don't know. I said, well, how many people are on the other aircraft? Let's start with that. How many people are on the other aircraft? Cause there was always two, there's always a pair. And so, um, you know, some time goes by and I'm, I'm starting to get annoyed because as a platoon sergeant, you know, accountability is my responsibility. So personnel equipment and, and all those things. And these are the, these are things that I need to know as we're getting there. So I need to know what we're walking into when we get there. And so, you know, I, I called the he was busy on the other radio. And so I called the RTO on his radio and I said, hey, get an answer for me before I run up there. And I just start jerking on his helmet straps and. And he goes, okay, hold on. And, he, and so then the, uh, the number comes back and I, he's he, at 38. And I said, that's how many people are on the manifest for both aircraft. And he goes, he goes, no, that's how many people are on that one aircraft. And I said, so you're telling me that the other bird is an empty ship. And he goes, yes. And so, well, I like to throw that out there. So when people think about this is that that is, is tactically, it's a correct decision. Uh, given the situation of, of what's already going on in the valley and, and the situation on the ground, is it is it wiser to split the force on both aircraft and then have to land both aircraft? Or is it safer for the aircraft to put everybody on one and then we're only risking one aircraft enemy fire and we can get that aircraft in real quick, it lands and get everybody off and then that one aircraft leaves and then we've only risked one aircraft and what is the other and, aircraft and, doing during during that point? It's um, he's they've the air that uh, so extortion one six has as um, one seven comes in on final. So the last one minute one six pulls off and it goes into what they call a high orbit. And so he's he's in the area, but he's out of the area and he's just flying in a circle, um, kind of a you know a, a large circle, and he's just waiting for one seven to land complete the infill lift off and then the two will pair back up and then they'll fly back to the base and so um when one seven got shot down because they have to fly in pairs one six had to get permission to fly back solo out of the airspace um because there's nothing the it situation. could do right there's nothing it can do and it you know and but in itself, it, it's not supposed to fly solo. It's supposed to fly in a pair, um, two aircraft together. So it has to get permission from its command to be able to return to base solo. And, and so, um, you know, that's, that's going on. And, you know, the, just when the numbers hit that, you know, it, it had happened um, on, on that, you know, that they had made the decision to put everybody on one aircraft. It was just, I was gobsmacked. I was like, wow. Um. But like I said, it's not a wrong decision. Yeah, they, no, they, they, no, they, they, it wasn't your decision. They made yeah, an assessment yeah. based on what's going on on the ground right, that right. it's better to put everybody right. in it on, was just on a one aircraft. Because yeah, yeah, right. Because if if that lead aircraft coming in to land uh, takes fire, that second aircraft's not going to land. So you only get half the guys on the ground, and then you have to figure out, you know, can we put this air, other aircraft in somewhere else? And then the guys have to try and figure out how to get together. And now you're talking about them trying to get together, being in a gunfight and all these things. So when we can put the whole force on one aircraft and you only have to infill one aircraft to the ground, you can put the whole force in at one time and then there's no risk or a minimal mitigated risk. Um, so they made that decision and, it, you know, it's not a tactically, it's a, not a wrong decision. Um, and, you know, but, you know, it, people go, well, why didn't Rangers do that? And I said, well, <laughs> they're coming in with half the numbers so they can put, all the guys on one aircraft. I have to have two. Right, right. You need them. And yeah, so you get a lot more people. I, regardless yeah. of, of what the tactical situation is, is, to bring my whole force to bear, I have to have both aircraft um, just because we're a, a much larger force. And um, so, you know, we start moving down the road and, you know, we've got this number. And so in my mind, I'm, I'm starting to go through all the list of things that we're going to need for, you know, for all of this recovery. And so, you know, then the next question comes, we're starting to talk to the aircraft that are overhead is, you know, is there any movement, you know, from the crash? Um, you know, is there anybody that's been thrown out or, you know, that's injured, that's still, you know, coherent moving on the objective? And the answer came back is like, we can't see anybody, but that's just because it's so bright. Um, we can't tell 
you know, based on the on the the light and the the heat signatures uh, of the fire, it's just too too much. And so, um, you know, then the question is, so what's moving around the objective area? Yeah, you know that that new objective area, that crash site. And so, um, yeah, you have to be careful. Everything kind of yeah. like went went crickets, you know, for the for the enemy because they had scored a big win on that. So you know, we we get up there on on target and we're we're getting real close. And so um, I, I didn't. The way the road worked is that it it walked. The road went right into the big village that the seals were planning on going into to to start picking a fight. And so I didn't want to to walk our force through the village and then over to the crash site. And so we made the decision to jump about a half a mile from that point. We decided to. Um, jump off the main road and and go through the fields and so we kind of cut a straight line as the crow flies you know from the road down through the fields and then across and and over and then um started securing the crash site and uh started conducting the recovery efforts nick consolidated his men and ordered them to move immediately to the crash site which was roughly three miles away He had no idea which aircraft had gone down or how many aircraft were involved or if the Taliban was waiting in ambush. Halfway to the site, he learned via radio of the staggering number of presumed dead, 38. His orders now were to secure the site and search for survivors. An hour later, Nick and his men approached and formed a capital T-shaped formation around the crash site. Nick found the body of a good friend who had been thrown from the helicopter when it exploded and landed in a nearby river. He was dead. They discovered seven more bodies that had been thrown from the helicopter. The Chinook itself was engulfed in a huge fireball. The heat and flames prevented Nick and his men from getting closer. He was 30 meters away when the last fuel cell on the down helicopter exploded knocking him and the other rangers to the ground. Nick got to his feet and radioed the grim news back to base. There are no survivors. What the rangers needed now were fire extinguishers rated for metal fires, body bags, nitro gloves, biohazard bags, and other recovery equipment. You know, we secured the perimeter and then started um, doing... It was still really, you know, on fire. I mean, we're talking about it sitting in a, a creek that's six feet below the, the bank wall, and then there's 30 feet of trees, and the flames are taller than the trees still, so it's nothing that we can do at this crash site at this moment. And um, so then we just started, you know, knowing that people get thrown from aircraft in, in this kind of a situation, you know, we started doing um, concentric circle searches, you know, as the um the crash itself is the bullseye and so then we had guys searching you know in circles all the way around both banks you know out for several hundred meters um just to make sure that if there was somebody who was thrown out we could find them and then doc could get over to him our medic and you know if they were alive we could get aid and you know we could get them on a litter and we could start calling for a medevac and you know so as we're coming in on this ob- objective the first first guy that we see that's been thrown from the, from the wreckage is uh Navy master or Navy chief, Rob Reeves. And, you know, Rob and I, Rob was their, their recce guy. So he's their routes guy and points guy. So I had several conversations and then he's just kind of a, an outgoing, you know, funny guy, uh, you know, in, in a, our, our cultured humor, you know, it's a lot of cynicism and sarcasm, but you know, it's all, it's all good. We, we all take it the same way. And uh, you know, uh, it was just kind of, smacked hard you know that it it's rob and and so um uh, i asked doc and and doc said no and so then you know as the guys were finding people was, they were marking them with you know chem lights so that doc could just move from chem light to chem light and and do the assessment and and uh um uh, one of the guys had that was thrown out i mean he he got thrown out and and took a uh, stone wall to the face and um so that was you know really hard when the guys kind of saw him because it was all distorted and 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 misshaped and and, um yeah um you know so 
initially right off the bat, you know, within the first 10 minutes, we had found six guys that had been ejected from the crash and nobody was alive. And, and so then it was, you know, everybody wants updates and everybody yeah, wants, yeah, yeah. you know, information on the radio. And, and so you can't really give it and, you know, said hey, we have, we have six, you know, friendly killed. Um, but you know, that's all we can find for now. We can't do anything. With yeah, the you can't go even near hot. it. Right. It's, it's so hot. Uh, yeah. Right. And so we are moving around the wreckage and I was trying to, you know, as docs going from person to person to person, you know, checking vitals and, and seeing if anybody's alive, I was, um, skirted around the side of the, the wreckage off the, the nose of the aircraft and, and was trying to make sure that all of, you know, my Ranger security element was everybody was tied together and we were actually a, forming a, a, you know, a circular type ish perimeter. And, and just to make sure that, you know, everything was good um, all the way around. And I had turned to come back across that field and one, one of the last fuel cells in the, in the fuel tank, uh, had, you know, finally ruptured and, and exploded. And it just, you know, I'm, I'm 40 yards away from it and it put me flat on my back. And then a couple of my guys who were up, you know, um, my medic and then one other of our EMTs um, were, you know, working on a guy who was not very far from it. And all I heard was him screaming and hooting and hollering and dancing around. And so I run over there and I'm like, what's going on? I'm like, my back's burning, my back's burning. And they had caught in a couple of pieces of frag off that helicopter. Oh, and one God. of them took it in the leg and one of them took it in the back. Nothing big, you know, maybe less than half the size of a toothpick. Um, and, you know, something that Doc could just grab a hold of and pull out. And then, you know, Doc reached down on his pant leg and pulled a little piece out of his calf muscle. And, and it, you know, it's all good. You know, it's a couple of little burn marks and some blistering. And, um, but other than that, you know, other at that point, all we could do was just kind of game plan what we were going to do and how we were going to recover this because we don't have any of the equipment. I requested a whole bunch of stuff. And, you know, as we're coming through, I had this laundry list of things that I thought, you know, I want, you know, class D fire extinguisher, which is rated for metal fires and magnesium and all the things that helicopters are made out of. Um, you know, we need body bags, you know, we need biohazard bags. We're going to need all this, you know, this stuff. And so we sent this list up to the jock and Bagram and said, Hey, we need this. And those guys were scrounging and scampering and trying to pull, but you know, the, the, the type of fire extinguishers that I wanted, the only ones they have are the great big, huge ones that sit on runways that are there to put the aircraft on, out. If it's catches on fire on the flight line and you can't drop those to me. Right. <laughs> on the ground right. and uh yeah that would be a bomb so, yeah yeah so all this stuff's finally starting to come together and they said hey you know we'll have we'll have to drop to you in about 60 minutes and uh so they're rigging all this equipment they're bringing you know water for the boys food for the boys all the the specialty equipment that i've asked for uh all this stuff's getting ready to to get flown in on on c-130 and, and kicked out of the back and and cargo dropped to us but you know so we go back to the to the previous situation is you know everybody's starting to ask you know what's taking so long to get get stuff in here. I said, do you realize the gravity of the situation that we have just walked into? Is that we are going to get the support that we need, but we are not going to get it right now. I said, and do you know why? And and you know and this is to the to the kind of some of the junior guys and you know squad leaders who are starting to get you know antsy for to to get this this whole train moving and, and this whole mission keep keep going and i said dude they have got to bring every piece of aircraft attack aircraft that's in this country overhead and and then everything that's going to come in on these cds drops is going to get an armed escort and that's all got to get coordinated it's not that we're not going to get what we need you just got to give them the time to put it together and the guys are like are you serious and i said yeah and so when that c-130 came in it had a uh, Two minutes before the C-130 came in to do the drop, we had a pair of A-10s come in and just ripped side, each side of that valley from one end to the other with their with their guns, and basically they're just clearing them. You know, yeah, just stay stay back, guys. Yeah, right. Yeah. And is is what it is. And then that C-130 came through at you know 500 feet and kicked out two big pallets of gear to us, and luckily they landed exactly where they wanted or where I, where we wanted them. I mean, one landed just west of the crash. I mean, like 50 yards west of the crash, which is almost a perfect drop. And then the other one was 50 yards east of the crash. And it was, I was like, you couldn't ask for a better drop in this situation. I mean, I've had 
training cargo drops that landed so far off that it was a huge pain to just go recover, you know, yeah. <laughs> fuel drums full of water. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And, and so, and then these guys hit the, hit the mark. Wow. And I was, I was impressed. And I told the, the RTO, I was like, Hey, make sure you call that flight crew and you tell them that it's a bullseye and it was a, a good strike and, and tell them, thank you. And this is still all at night, right? <laughs> Uh, no, the sun has just, just come started up to come up by the time this is, this is all, all happened. I mean, it's, you know, probably eight, eight o'clock, eight, nine o'clock in the morning. So it's, you know, it's the temperature outside, you know, 70 and climbing. Um, and you know, we've got this huge fire still raging roaring huh? in the background. Yeah. So it's, you know, on, on site right there in that area is, you know, it's pushing a hundred and something at nine o'clock in the morning and it's just getting hotter as the day goes on. And so, you know, we've had this time now we've kind of um, I've delegated, you know, tasks of, of how things are going to happen. And, you know um, I just said, you know, make sure that when we start pulling these guys out we start moving them to, you know, line them up to get accountability that, you know, everybody gets treated like family. I was like, regardless of your personal feelings, these guys just paid the ultimate price Absolutely. for, for what, you know, just happened and, and they earned every ounce of respect that we can get them. I, I, you know, I I said, nobody gets dropped, nobody gets thrown. I said, and if something crazy has to happen to get these guys out of this fire, you're going to ask me first. And, and so, you know, we start working through this and I can see the, the, just the mental strain, um, taking its toll on some of the guys. And, And I, as a leader, I was trying not to expose too many people to this, you know, grotesque situation that that's being dealt with. And, and so, but I could also see the, the physical strain and the mental strain on the guys that are doing it. And after we got about halfway done, I was like, okay, you guys need to, you guys need to stop. Um, so I rotated, you know, my other senior squad that had more senior guys in it. And I said, are you going to go up and replace, um, you know, first squad uh, uh, up in their position and, and take a break. And first squad's going to come down and relieve you and, and we'll finish this out, you know, with, with first squad, but uh, you know, um, and so we, we did the switch and, you know, first squad came down and, and it kind of gave them this, the same guidance, you know, that I'd given second squad about, you know, how we're handling this and treating people and, and, um, you know, we're getting the numbers count starting to, to climb, you know, we're starting to get closer towards, you know, accountability of, of everybody that, that we need to have accountability of. And, um, uh, you know, one of the situations that we had to deal with was, um, so the, the canine handler that was on that aircraft, he's responsible for himself and, and that canine. So in the event of these kind of situations, you know, you can't have, the the dog can't be flying loose through the helicopter um so what he does is the, the handler will will great basically he'll just bear hug the dog and and to keep control of him so he's not a projectile in the aircraft you know so he doesn't hurt somebody or hurt himself and so um you know we, we found the handler with the dog and, and he had that dog in that that kind of a bear hug embrace and it was um kind of one of those um, we couldn't move the two together. It was, you know, cause we're trying, we don't have, we have one stretcher um, that we can use. And that was all I was willing. I had three on target, but I wasn't willing to give up the other two in case we actually got in a gunfight and we needed them for our own guys. So I was only willing to commit one. So we were moving, you know, the remains on one stretcher, which was melting from the heat of these guys getting put on it. And so then we were using our climbing ladders as, you know, makeshift stretchers to move, you know, the remains out of the crash and, and over to where we're the uh, casualty collection point where we're maintaining accountability. And so it was too awkward to move the two together. And so the, you know, the guys are like, Hey, what's, you know, what are we doing with this situation? I said, well, I don't want to break his arms. And so they said, well, what are we going to do? And I said, well, just, you know, as best you can, you're going to have to break the dog. And, you know, we love our, our combat dogs, our, our canines, you know, they're, you know, they're our pet, they're our mascot, you know, even if they're a mean dog that you can't pet, it's still, you know, all the boys love that dog. 
you know, and e- even their dog, you know, because when we do canine training and stuff, they, you know, get volunteers. The boys all like to get in the bite suit and then get the dog to chase them and bite them. And it's just, it's fun. I mean, if you ever get the chance to do it with law enforcement, just do it. It's a, it's an eye opening experience. And, you know, it's kind of fun for new guys to, to see that because or experience it because then they understand, you know, what that animal is bringing to the table on target. And when we turn that dog loose and you know exactly what he's going to do, because that's, that's his one sole purpose in life. is just a, to be a missile with teeth. <laughs> and, and so when, you know, when that comes down, you know, it's like, you know, it's one of those heartbreaking things. It's like, well, I really don't want to break this guy's arms. I, I don't want to deal with that. So, you know, I guess the, the, more honorable way to deal with the situation is to, you know, break the dog. And, and so that's kind of like one of the worst decisions that, you know, we had to, had to make on that. And, um, you know, so we get accountability of everybody and it's, you know, still, I don't know, it's probably 1130, 12 o'clock local time. By the time we call in, you know, the, the final numbers that, you know, we have accountability of, you know, everybody. And then, you know, we get stuck, um, you know, waiting. So while all this is going on, um, you know, we have a, uh, combat patrol that's coming out of the cop in the East and one that's coming out of the cop in the West to try and reinforce us. And also they're bringing in trucks to be able to transport the remains out. And so it wasn't a matter of not having enough firepower in there. It was a matter of them dealing with IEDs every yeah, two, just getting in meters. there. Yeah. And it, it took them hours to get in there. They launched at the same time that aircraft went down and it took them till, you know, mid afternoon to get in. When the sun came up the next morning, August 7th, the Chinook was still raging hot. Nick realized he was probably the only guy in special operations in Afghanistan who had previously dealt with recovery and who was still operating at a strike force level. He had previously worked on the Marcus Luttrell recovery six years earlier. Meanwhile, the crash situation had become the number one U.S. priority in country. Everything and everyone was retasked to support Nick and his fellow rangers on the ground. Air assets were stacked overhead every 1,000 feet, up to 35,000 feet up. And two ground assault convoys pushed into the valley, one from the west and the other from the east. The convoy from the west cleared six massive IEDs but eventually made it in. The other convoy turned around and aborted because they had run into an IED every 800 meters. Finally, all the remains were recovered and placed in body bags, including the working dog and his handler, who were found together. Nick said they tried to be respectful of the bodies, but what they found was a tangled mess. 36 hours after the Rangers had deployed, they returned to base. So what it was was that um, one of the other Ranger platoons from Jalalabad <clears throat> had flown up to QRF us since, you know, the SEAL team had gotten shot down. Um, and they were sitting, you know, in our jock at, at uh, Shank. And uh, they were watching everything and they were getting kitted up and, and everything was, they, you know, what they needed to bring on to target to to re- relieve us in place. And and so we kind of sat there for a while waiting for the plan to, to get passed down on what was going to happen and how they were going to come in and how we were going to go out. And so we were just tasked with, um, you know, guarding this, securing, continuing to secure this crash site. And so um, kind of, you know, at this point, you know, everything's done. The remains have been taken by the battle space owner and their convoy. And, you know, we've gotten word over the jock that they've been transloaded um, on this 47s and they're everybody's on their way to Bagram. And, you know, so I put the kind of put the boys down at 50 percent security that nothing's nothing's really happened all day long. It's, you know, it's crickets out here. And, and so start kind of getting the guys the ability to, to get a little bit of sleep and, and take a nap and. You know, this is, you know, pushing three, four, five o'clock in the afternoon, finally. And, and, um, I, I finally, you know, talked to my platoon leader, uh, Jake, and, and he said, look, he's like, I can't get off the radio. So you might as well take a look, take a nap or, or something. And I said, are you sure? I said, cause I can jump on the radio and talk just as well as you can. And he goes, no, no, it's fine. I was like, yeah. 
And so I said, okay. And so I went and kind of took a nap and I was laying on this piece of four inch packing foam from those uh, cargo drops as kind of a, you know, cheap makeshift bed. So better sleeping in the dirt. Right. And I uh, just remember, you know, uh, looking off to the, to the West and kind of saw this weather pattern that was moving in. And, oh God. And, uh, <laughs> well, you know, and you just don't really think about it. You're like, oh, okay, great. At least it's not dumping on us. It's not going to rain on us. Cause you know, I'm, I'm a kid from Kansas. I grew up, so I know what rain looks like coming from the sky. I know what green clouds mean. I know what all this stuff is. And so I'm, I'm just kind of watching it and you know, we got just this little light sprinkle on us. I mean, it was just enough to say it was sprinkling, but it, you know, it, it just was kind of one of those. Mist. Yeah. Well, not even, I mean, it was just a few little drops in it, but it just felt so good. And I remember sitting there going, this is amazing. And I, I'm, and I'm thinking, I'm like, at least we're not getting dumped on like what's happening off in the West. And so uh, the sun's starting to set and one of my gun positions on the West side of the, the, the river bottom, he goes, Hey, uh, it sounds like there's a truck coming down the, down the, the, the Creek. And I don't know why I still to this day don't know why, but the first thing in my mind was, please tell me you're not in the river. Before. Yeah. And he goes, yeah. Oh my God. Why? Yeah. I said, get, get out. out quick. Yeah. And I mean, it, it's a six foot wall that he had to climb and, you know, in full, full gear and throw a machine gun up, up on the top. And no sooner had he gotten up on the top than this four foot wall of water flash flood came through and just wiped what was a very contained wreck and just spread it out for a quarter of a mile. Oh, wow. So the, so it, it just dis- took the wreck with it. It just, yeah, it just lifted everything. I mean, it just, this wall of water just came through and just lifted the, the engines and the, what was left of the ramp and it just kind of spread it all out. And I was like, well, that's going to suck to explain. Well, lucky your guy got out of there and he would have been, yeah, yeah. he would have been. And, uh, you know, sure. and that's still to this day. It was like, you know, try, we, we, we joke about it. It's like, Hey, uh, the crash it was, uh, all contained and dry. It's a uh, four feet underwater now. And everybody's like, well, there's no weather pattern that's showing over you. I was like, well, it's called a flash flood and it happened way off in the West. Right. right. And, uh, that's the way know, the took, water comes from over there. It took a few hours for it to get down here. And, uh, so, uh, you know, that happened and, um, you know, we just continued to wait. So the, the, our relief in place at infield and, uh, they're, um, walking down off the top of the Northern Ridge and, and coming down in to, uh, to relieve us. And they finally made it down about, I was just a little bit before midnight that they made it down. And, uh, I was, I've never been so happy to hand off this kind of a, an objective to, to, to somebody, because I knew the guy, we were friends. The platoon sergeant for the relieving ranger platoon was a friend of mine that I served with at second battalion and he transferred battalions and went to first battalion. Um, and so when he just came up and gave me this big bear hug in the dark, you know, and I heard his voice, I was just, um, I was immediately like relieved that, you know, he, he knew me, I knew him. And so I didn't, you know, that this was going to be real easy to hand this over to, to him. And, and that I knew that it was going into capable hands to, to finish this mission. And then, so we did the, the handoff. I mean, it worked the, the same way that we teach it and train it, you know, it was textbook. And so then as soon as his guys got in place and, and everybody was, you know, all my guys were relieved and, and, you know, collapsing back out of the security perimeter. It was, you know, it was time to leave. I was like, Hey man, I'll see you on the flip side. And so he said, just follow the, you know, he said, we marked the trail on the way down. He said, just follow the lights on the way up. And, and he said, I'll see you in a few days when it's over. And so, um, it, you know, it took us, uh, several hours to walk back up out of, out of that valley because everybody's just tired and and draining you know everybody's drained and um you guys are starting to walk slow and i'm looking at my watch going oh we have to make this exfil before daylight <laughs> and it's you know two in the morning and we're still halfway there yeah, yeah and you know i start coming on the radio and i was like hey i know everybody's sucking i know everybody's tired but we have two hours to get there we're halfway there and uh, if you want to go home tonight yeah 
you better hurry right, up right, right. and start grabbing you know people and start pushing them up this hill and i was like hey i am just as tired and worn out and mentally drained and exhausted as you guys are but we got to get there and um I said, because they're not coming in. Once the sun comes up, yeah. they're not coming. We're gonna have to we'll wait. sit on top of them. We'll sit on top of this ridge for another day. And uh, that probably and so got them moving we fast, make it faster. Up. Yeah. Well, not really, <laughs> but it got them moving faster. Right. right. <laughs> and so we we get up there and uh, and get pushed out, and it's right as the sun's coming up. We're calling Xfil. Luckily, it was only a ten minute time of flight for the aircraft to to leave and and come get us. But um, it was kind of one of those very uh, humbling moments, if you will, when you step on that aircraft and the sun's coming up and you're flying off and, and you just think that, you know, just what has transpired in the last 24 hours of, you know, everything went from great to the worst possible scenario to, you know, I have this so much pride in, you know, what these guys have just accomplished and the gravity of the situation that they have shown immense maturity to face and, and, you know, hold it together through and, and, you know, and then it's, it just kind of that sunrise is just always like a real sweet memory yeah, I bet. of, I of bet. you know, and, what's going and we're on. talking and then, like 20, what, 24 year old, something like that. Uh, most you of know, them. the majority of the average ranger is 18 to 24 years old. And so you're talking about guys that have, you know, limited life experience and, um, you know, to, to see something that as, as tragic and as terrible as that scene was and to hold, you know, the amount of composure and the maturity and just the respect for, for those guys, um, you know, and so we, you know, fly back, uh, land and the, uh, the big, seal commander that was the in charge of the task force he would he'd flown in uh, on our exfil bird and and was sitting on there was talking to uh uh jake my platoon leader on on the way back and then he just wanted to be there on the ground and you know talk to the boys as soon as they got off the the helicopter so we kind of pulled everybody in and um kind of had this little impromptu um with him and you know it was just him expressing his gratitude and you know and, and you know what emotions he could gather for that, that situation. But, um, we just kind of took him probably 10 minutes on the flight line after that, where we just didn't do, we didn't go anywhere. We just kind of took a moment to just, you know, yep. uh, let it sink in kind of. Yep. Right. And I just told the boys, I said, Hey, as you're ready, you know, get on the bus. And when, when we're all on the bus, then we'll go back. And that was probably, the worst was um, when we pulled back in the camp because it was like a ghost town. There was nobody there, you know, and, and, you know, we, we came back with the same number that we left with, you know, we didn't have any injuries other than, you know, a couple of blisters and, and, you know, they have lost an entire element. And so it was just kind of one of these, I, I don't really want to, see them and it's not because I, I i don't know what to say i don't know how to express you know anything and a lot of it was you know their support guys that were in the jock you know as we were getting off the bus and taking our gear off you know and, and coming back out of our our um ready room you know they just they didn't say anything they just came over and they just wanted hugs and you know was yeah, what do you say just all emotional and, and you know it's like i don't know what to say and and they say, well, you don't have to say anything because we watched it all. Two months later, on October 8th, 2011, while tracking another target on the east side of the Tangi Valley, a 7.62 millimeter round slammed into Nick's thigh. A second round entered the armpit of his right shoulder and tore through his biceps and out. And a third went through his helmet rode alongside his right temple and came out near the top, damaging his night vision goggles. Nick spent a week at a hospital in Bagram and was then medevac to Germany. After 13 deployments to Afghanistan and Iraq, his days of leading missions in the field were over. Nick was awarded a Purple Heart, two Bronze Stars, and the Army Commendation Medal with Valor Device. 
Asked if he would do it all again, Nick answered, yes. He says he doesn't miss the deployments or the army politics. He misses the people and being a leader of men even during bad times. He also says that it was an honor and privilege to have stood for so long among those giants. We highly recommend Nick's excellent book, Run to the Sound of Guns, and we thank him for his service. It's an honor and privilege to call Sergeant First Class Nicholas Moore of the 75th Ranger Regiment, today's hero behind the headlines. Thanks for listening. I'm your host, Ralph Pizzullo. Our producers are myself, Frank Hobbs, and Apex Media. If you haven't already, please download, rate, review, and subscribe. And check out some of our past episodes, such as Black Hawk Down and The Battle That Never Ends. And don't forget to tune in to the next episode of Heroes Behind Headlines. <laughs>